Hi, everybody, and nice to see everyone. Um, so I think maybe partly there's a slightly larger crowd than usual because the book is such a warm and loving and sweet book. And we, um, you know, we, we've been tending to read kind of serious books for the book group. <laughs> and so that's, um, that's my problem. My mother used to say to me, why do you always read depressing books? What's the matter with you? And, and, and I'd say, well, they're not depressing to me. And she'd just roll her eyes and leave the room. So, um, but I think we, uh, Nancy and I have both been watching uh, Jane Smiley interviews. And um, it, it, one of the things that I love about how she presents this is that um, the, the German short hair in the, in the book was, is based on her own German short hair, who they put down a few years ago, but who she spent 14 years with. And, and Paris in the book is her horse. And, and the lineage of Paris is the lineage of her current thoroughbred. Isn't that right, Nance? Isn't that what you remember hearing? Yeah. Oh, you muted yourself as well? Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes, you're correct. That's what she said. Good. Um, and, and the thing that she said, that that makes the most sense for any of us that our lives around pets or farm animals or any other kind of interaction on a consistent basis with animals is you really do get the sense that they're communicating with each other and they're communicating with you <laughs> and 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 she said she said this great thing in, in one of the interviews where she said well i know i know they're not talking but they're definitely communicating and they're communicating with me and they're communicating and, and I can see them communicating with each other uh and and it just it's so true I mean I just I mean my dog is under my table right now remarkably just sleeping but um but I mean constantly sort of in a dialogue with me and uh, oh, and then the other thing that she said that I thought was absolutely hilarious was you know, she, she had this idea of doing the raven, and that was partly because she'd been she was walking around, uh, you know, the the the, Ch the Champ du Mar and on all the other places that where she was writing about, and she just noticed the number of ravens sitting in trees, and she thought oh, I should get a I should I should get a raven into this book, and. Uh, and then she, and then she, she saw some. She said, "Oh, you know what? I need to have some kind of rodent type thing." And then she realized, "Oh, in an old house, there'd be rats." Um, so, and then someone asked her in one of these readings, um, "How come there's no cats?" And she said, "I didn't feel that a cat and a rat would be a would be a, a successful pairing uh, trying to live in a house." And and you know, it's hard to. To, to, to fight with that answer. But, but here's my favorite thing, and it's about the editing process, really. She sort of fell in love with the rat being, I mean, with the, with the raven just blathering on about stuff. And, and finally, her, her, her agent and her editor called her and said, you've just got to make this raven shut up. <laughs> just, just, he's, just, he's just talking too much. So he, um, you know, she did. She got him to. to he had a, a, a moment where he realized, oh yeah, I should, uh, I should stop talking. And even that was really, you know, that was so well done. Um, and then, I, then I want to do. I'm going to do one more thing, and then I'm going to ask Larry to talk about a particular moment in the book that I know he really loved. But there, there are so many little moments where Jane Smiley, just because she's so skilled, I mean, you know, she's really a huge skilled writer. You know, she's won the Pulitzer Prize. If you haven't ever read A Thousand Acres, it's just a truly brilliant book. Um, and many of her other books are great. But um, at, in the, at the beginning of the epilogue, <laughs> she says, here, here's what she says about the, you know, and, and it's, this is Delphine noticing, you know, the various animals relating and she says, and a raven was picking his way sideways along the top of the stall door, cawing, you might say, informatively. <laughs> and so that's her way of a human 
noticing that, yeah, that sounds like she's giving a lecture or something, you know, but, but, you know, so we know what the raven's doing and Delphine doesn't, but by Delphine noticing it, then we get a smile of a kind of, oh, Jane, aren't you a clever boots kind of smile. Um, but just, but, it, but what it, but the best thing about that is it's just about noticing, you know, noticing what the animals around you are doing. And how they're, oh my God, Nancy, look, oh, that's, oh, I thought, is that an actual cat? But as What, this? Yes. yes. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> McDaniel has this huge cat picture behind her. Okay. Um, but so I, I just feel like the, the book is is so wonderful in, in the ways the animals relate to each other. But then the way that the humans... And I think I said this in my newsletter about it. Um, you know, the way the humans are just so accepting of the animals and, and not worried about the animals. Uh, and I, I remember making a mark early in the, where somebody, some one of the people who'd already interacted with the, with the horse just said, oh, well, it's not my business. If they don't want to find the horse, let them find it. You know, and, and it's just that sense of just letting things happen around you and being aware. And then at the end of the book, when, when the whole thing gets brought out in the newspaper and then all humans kind of come together and all of them are kind of telling each other parts of the story. And it's just so great. I mean, just such a brilliant way to kind of blend those two, those two, you know, the two, there are all the species together and the humans thinking, oh, now why didn't I figure that out? Or what, you know, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, and how also the animals bring the humans, in some cases, together, even creating a little love match, uh, which I thought was just great. Really, really great. Larry, you want to talk about that moment? Which, because I, I agree with you, I laughed out loud when I read that in the book. I, I would be happy to, but I just want to say, I don't, I can't remember any other book so successfully having multi point of views and from animals. I mean, I used to teach to middle schoolers Old Geller and Call of the Wild this was so much better. Yeah. And, I, and I really don't think this book would have worked in America. I think the setting in Paris, it just captured the positive French uh, stereotypes of tolerance and, you know, they respected the animals. So that was great. But uh, on... Uh, on 178, uh, the, uh, I can't remember what's the name of the old lady, Madame something. Um, well, they she do said, Madame, yeah. Madame de Mornay is how she's usually. Thank you. She's talking about uh, the kid who was no wild child like the boy she had seen in some film, when was that? A friend had taken her, then introduced her to the director, a handsome man whose name always made her think of Truffle. And unless you're a big Francois Truffaut fan, which I am, you might not know that she was referencing this, what's considered a minor film of his, The Wild Child, based on this true story. But it was just so funny that Truffles, Truffaut, and she had a lot of great humor in the book like that, but that was one that I, I laughed out loud. Yeah, it, it was really great, because that is a, a, a good way to remember his his name, or something like, you know, you'd be like, oh, his name is something to do with food, yeah, with, with something, yeah, but he was the sweetest director, too, I mean, he was, that's so Truffle is a perfect, perfect thing for him, um, yeah, that's so, oh, she's, she's really something. Um, so I, I think we should just open it up and get people to, to start talking about it because so many people have mentioned to us how much they love the book. Um, what did you like? I mean, I'm going to talk about the great grandmother later, but people talk about what, you know, what, what drew you. 
were you trepidatious to start thinking, oh God, really a book about a horse in Paris? Um, well, it was kind of what you had mentioned earlier about people, you know, not getting involved and getting in the way of, of the action. Um, and it felt like there was a lot of patience um, also between the characters. I mean, they let the ducks squabble. They let the raven, you know, nest wherever he wanted to nest. Um, you know, Frida, the dog, could could go up and ask for um, some food and everyone was patient with the, with the dog and understood about her history. Um, so I found that, that piece of it really touching throughout the whole book, actually. Mm -hmm. I, love the, I love the, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, James, James, you replied to Adele and then Nancy McDaniel had something she wanted to say, please. Oh. Um, no, I was just going to say that I love the fact that the greengrocer basically made change for the dog. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that was so great. <laughs> that was my laugh out loud moment. So yeah. there you go. <laughs> Correct <laughs> change. So. <laughs> Person running a store. That's what I like. Yes, Nancy, what were we going to say? Well, I. Um, we had an interesting conversation about this the other day, and one of my friends who knows that I like kind of um, heavy and angst-laden theater was amazed that I love this book so much, because <laughs> it's not heavy and angst-laden, it's just lovely. Um, and I've been, I've been actually thinking about that since then and trying to figure out why I love this book as much as I did. Um, I, 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 and I don't think it was, I was just looking for a lighter side of something, but I, I, this is not a question, it's sort of a comment, it's sort of an observation. Oh, I thought that was the introduction to your observation. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I mean, I, I could go on, but there's too many people, so. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody else think that, I mean, oh, yes, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead and finish, and then I just have a comment. No, you can't. I'm tired of my talking. You talk. Okay. <laughs> well, it was interesting when you were, everybody talking about the, um, how accepting everyone was of the animals and, and just kind of, you know, let them do their thing and made change for the dog and everything. And I read a really charming book years ago called Spotted in France, um, about an American who's living in Paris and feeling kind of very alone and apart. And then he gets this dog and all of a sudden the world opens up to him because everybody is so accepting of him now that he has this dog. Mm. And they travel all over France on a, um, on a scooter, on a Vespa. And the dog is welcomed in all the restaurants and you know they, they feed him out of a silver bowl in different places. And, and it just was kind of the same feeling of um, the animals being accepted as just other creatures that you're living around. Mm. You know, and I and I loved that. And I, I've um, I've also been watching the new adaptation of All Creatures Great and Small. And I think between that and this, it's kind of saved me this winter. <laughs> um, it just both, you know, so charming and so warm. Great. Um, Jim and Rita, I think, have something to say. Let me unmute myself. Okay, I'm muted. So um, first I wanted to thank you for doing this and for suggesting this book. This is the first time we've been on the um, this book club. And actually the fact that um, I my wife gave me Hamnet for Christmas. And after I read that, I said, oh, I should have jumped on that when you guys first did it. And so, um, so partly it was that recommendation and then partly it had Paris in the title and, you know, <laughs> I think we're suckers for many books that have Paris in the title. Um, um, and it was, and one thing is that you, you, I entered into the book very easily, you know, and I think that because um, Jane Smiley writes so well, 
And I think the moment that really got me was when um, Paris picked up the purse, because after all, she had heard of purses. She knew, she knew what a purse was, you know, um, um, because of racing. Um, and, and that just seemed fit. And probably my favorite moment in the book um, was just a very small one when Madame is walking and Frida's walking beside her. And when she starts to get a little unsteady, Frida just kind of leans up against her, kind of the way our, our Greyhound leans up against us. And, um, and she didn't even notice, but she, she, um, she steadies her steps and goes on. And it just, there was that kind of smoothness um, about the, of the book. And although two thirds of the way through, I thought, I have no idea how she's gonna make this come out. Uh, um, but you know, but you also knew that she would. Wait, she would. Yeah. yeah. I I love how it, it it's very Parisian to me. The the fact that the groundskeeper sees a horse and you know says it's really not his job to deal with this horse. You know, and if 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 it was important, somebody would have told him about it above him, and his employees assume the same thing about him. You know, if this horse was important, if we were supposed to do something, somebody would have told us. And it's such a, I, I think it's a very Parisian thing. You, know, um, you just kind of go on. And I, I loved um, the way the animal characters develop, like characters develop in any book. You know, it's just, it was delightful. It was really fun to, to do <laughs> in the midst of this winter and everything else, so. Yeah, at a time when Paris is so closed down, yeah. right, you know, to think of Paris vibrant and alive, yeah. yeah. Um, Mike and Charlotte have something they'd like to say. Well, um, we, I would be like some of the earlier, the earlier person who commented that I would be surprised that I liked the book because it's not typically what I like. Um, and then uh, the most recent comment about it, being a sucker for anything Paris, I was willing to to read it, and it only and I was still a little skeptical until the until they started walking down behind the Trocadero down the hill through the park and across the river, and then I was all in because as it we Mike and I had spent a month in Paris in January of 2017, and the Women's March in Paris started at the Trocadero. And the, the way Jane described the horse going down the hillside, including a gate that I swear we there was somebody who actually did open a gate to a path and then we all walked down. And so, okay, but <laughs> she, so it was, I think at, at various points, probably each, is, each of us found something um, some little detail that made the book believable for us. And so then we were bought into it. And, and I think that that was probably one of her skills was to put enough of those little nuggets in there at the beginning that we'd latch on to. And, and I found it very interesting because there were no villains. There yes. was no one. I mean, it was, yes. it was something that what would happen in a world where everyone just kind of lived and let live and, and just, just, Gave a little, a little bit extra room for someone else to be who they are, and that's what all the characters did. And then, how did it turn out? They all lived happily ever after, except for the great grandmother. But that was to be expected. She was ninety-seven. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> all right, we have another newbie. Miss Caitlin wanted to add something. Oh yeah, go ahead, Caitlin. This is speaking back to that idea of uh, normally reading more depressing or, or somber books and why this one appealed. I felt that way as well, but I think I actually found a lot of this story to be very sad, kind of in a bittersweet way, because as the characters, like, they all become more connected with each other, they become more self-aware. And there's this loss of innocence that you're observing that I found really heartbreaking in a lot of ways um, because they're, they're seeing their own trauma through the eyes of their friends as they're developing those relationships. And we as readers understand, you know, we understand why Frida is skittish or why 
Haras doesn't like cars. You know, like we we have that understanding, but we're watching them learn that about themselves. And I think that's both delightful, but also very heart wrenching. Wow. Um, tell me if I'm wrong, but ATN never speaks a word, does he? Does he ever say a word? Hmm. I don't think he does. I don't think he ever speaks. I thought we were going to find out that he was mute or something. Yeah, no, we're just, we're privy to his thoughts all the time, but we're, yeah, right. I don't, right. Because he's all, oh, because the only person he interacted with, the only person was deaf. So it wouldn't matter. Right. He probably got into the habit of not speaking to her. Right. So he used, you know, he was nonverbal like the animals and yet was still able to communicate with all of them. Yeah. But, um, Barb Jenkin, who is also new to book club tonight, would like to say something. Barb, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi. <clears throat> yes. Um, I thought she had just an, an incredible grasp of, of animal um, behavior for all the animals. It, it rang very true for me, you know, as somebody who is had several horses in my life. I mean, it, that was all, you know, I could totally, you know, relate and immerse myself in, you know, what she was, was writing about how the animals, um, you know, how the ducks, it, it, you know, their, their mannerisms and, you know, their personalities that she, I guess, for lack of a better word, created for them or of them. Um, it, it was just quite a wonderful book to read. And it was kind of a page turner. It's like, so what's going to happen next here, you know? And um, the, one, the one thing, though, that I thought, like at night, there wasn't anybody around. And I don't know if that was a construct to, to make the, the story work, so to speak. But like any big city, it never sleeps, you know? And so, you know, saying that there was nobody out after dark in downtown Paris didn't seem, didn't seem to ring true for me. And I don't know if other people, I haven't been to Paris, but even like Madison, you know, there's always something going on almost 24 seven. So, you know, if other people have any comments about that. I think you had to suspend your rational uh, thought when reading the book. I mean, even though the old lady was deaf, it's like, you can't hide a horse in a house. She's gonna bump into the horse or something. Yet the way she, Smiley wrote it, it was believable that he got away with having this menagerie of animals and she had a routine. And so I think you just had to not think about, of course, he would have run into people. Um, I mean, I kept waiting for all these bad things to happen to the kid and the animals because one of my complaints about most television shows they never let anybody be happy and love. Something bad always has to happen. There's always a conflict. And you're like, you know she's going to die. The kid's going to be taken away. The animals are going to be split up. Yet, miraculously, it all worked out. And it was believable in a far-fetched way. Well, and, and just one thing, I, I think that's great, Larry. Um, Barbara, that, I, I guess one way to justify it is because those, the Champ du Mar is so big, the huge park, and, and then there's a military school and academy next near, to, near it, so that, you know, after dark, there wouldn't be many people in the park, that's for sure. Um, and so, I mean, even, even, and this was the winter too, and in fact, Jane Smiley said in one of those interviews, she, she intentionally started it in the winter so that 
it would be dark. It would be dark. You know, the days would be short, and the the animals would have the the night, the dark of the night, to protect them. You know, longer nights to protect themselves. But but yeah, I think you do any book like this. You have to do some suspension. <laughs> of rational trying to make it too uh, but I, I like i mean i agree larry i kept thinking oh god what's something terrible is going to happen to one of these animals and then i'm going to throw the book across the room but i uh but it just it just it never did and and i really kept thinking by the end of it oh sorry hannah hannah just collapsed on my foot um the uh by the end of it i thought this ending is perfect I mean, she brought the people together to understand things, and the animals all made a choice. You know, it's like when remember when the horse says, "I've got a plan to save him," and and I just thought, and the boy started to figure out that the animals were all focused on saving him. And and, I, and the other thing that I and I want to I, I want to bring this up and then let people talk about it. I just felt the way that Jane Smiley brought out the history of the great grandmother was so beautifully done. You know, and it, it, the first time you hear about her family, it's like reading a you know an obituary almost. It's so blunt and short. It's just this: my son died. My you know my husband was killed. And you just, you know, and, you, and, I, and I remember reading it and thinking, oh, my God, you know, all this tragedy in this woman's life. But then when she, then as the book went on, Jane Smiley let these, there, there'd be a page and a half where she, the woman would be thinking and, and remembering certain things. And you just got this incredible tenderness about her life. And since many of us in this book club are, uh, say, over 30, um, we're aware of time passing and people not there anymore and, you know, and how your brain, things rotate up into your brain. I mean, I said a word last night and I thought, God, I haven't heard anybody say that word since my, oh my God, my college girlfriend used that word all the time. I hadn't thought of that in 50 years. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just, but I just thought she did a she did this magnificent job of filling in the grandmother, the great grandmother's life, and including the great grandmother knowing she wasn't doing the right thing for her great grandson, that she should somehow try to get it protected, because what if she died before she'd figured it out? And then, of course, that's what happens. And I, but I just thought it was so beautifully handled. I don't know, did anybody else? react to her in any in any way um, you, Nick, you said somebody else needed to say something okay um my chat is kind of overlaying my participants list so if i don't see that you want to say something you might just have to unmute yourself and say it because it's kind of a jump all here Lisa has I, so, I want to i will this is kate browse um I listened to one of her book uh, interviews, which there are quite a few of them online, and, and she's quite wonderful describing writing the book. And one of the questions posed to her is what we're discussing here, which is they said she had a an antagonist. There was no antagonist in the book. That is, everyone was very cooperative, and all the characters let each other be, and and there really wasn't um, a, an antagonist. And she said. Life itself was the antagonist. Um, it was uh, death, hunger, cold, um, all the realities of staying alive. Uh, the the you know the the, uh, the the mallard had to guard her eggs. You know all of the potential threats, the guard, all these different things, and she said that serves fine as an antagonist in the book. And so all of her characters basically were protagonists and got along. I thought that was quite brilliant. No, oh, that's great. Lisa, you had, yeah, you had some. I just felt, I was so happy for Entian at the end because he had done such a beautiful job of caring for his grandmother, great grandmother, for, at a very young age. And for him to be able to 
Paris saying, I'm going to take care of him now. And it just, it was so touching. It, the whole book was touching and funny in many ways. And I agreed that there were, you know, Frida had a little sadness throughout, but just how Jean Smiley, she's, I listened to one of her events also, and she's so modest. She's just this very modest person. And I think maybe you have to be that type of person to write, write this type of book. I don't know, because she did have this great understanding of animals and how they are part of, we're all in it together. <laughs> and um, so I just was so, I really loved the ending, how they all got stayed together. And I really loved Kurt the rat. That rat was hilarious. I mean, he was such a great character. <laughs> and how Delphine just, you know, kind of folded him, fold, they folded him in as well. So I, thought that was I loved Kurt too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I like, you know, you can say you laughed out loud. I like for real laughed out loud. Yes. And, and I think that um, the fact that Sid had visited the pond when Raul was there the first time, I think that Sid and Nancy will end up out there at some point too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The gang will all be together. Thank you. Well, but I think that, that goes back to what Caitlin was saying before about that there is because the world is a scary place for animals on their own <laughs> and the way that they had to sort of protect themselves and plot and try to protect each other. Yeah, I mean, we, we carry around that knowledge that they're always in danger and, you know, they know it innately, but they don't, you know, they're, they're just kind of watching out for each other. And I, so I do think there is a sense, plus, I think all of us are just assuming something bad's got to happen to one of these characters because that's what makes it a book. You know, nothing bad happens. What's the point? <laughs> uh, so I, I, that's, I just thought that was really, really well constructed so that we're kind of, we're experiencing it in a sort of total way that, that of course, none of the animals can and none of the humans can because none of the humans have the whole picture. Uh, so it's just, uh, you know, it's really powerful. So were the ducks Sid and Nancy named after Sid Vicious from the Sex Pistols and his girlfriend? There was a movie years ago, Sid and Nancy, about him and his girlfriend. Yeah, I assume that's who they were named after, but I-, I okay. So that was funny because they, again, if you wouldn't know them, but that's hysterical. Yeah, I, I listened to it on, I read it and I listened to it on um, Libro and they gave them British accents. So I, I think CS. <laughs> yes. Wow. Um. Uh, Genevieve says it's nice to see everyone's pets tonight. <laughs> you have no idea, Genevieve. I have my own four yeah. cats and a dog crowding around me. So. A lot of pets around. I'm in between pets, so I just live on kitten lady videos. So this is nice too. <laughs> Cats again at some point, I hope. For me. Did somebody okay. oh, go, ahead. go ahead? Oh, I was just gonna say, I know we say we're never gonna call on anybody, but Kate Montgomery, do you, do you have any input from Japan? <laughs> Nothing uh Japan specific, I don't think, but um I was kind of reluctant to start this book because I had the same thought that a bunch of people have mentioned. Oh, it's a book about animals. Okay, <laughs> not really my kind of thing. But I liked so much that there wasn't really an antagonist outside of just normal life things. Because I've read so many books the past few months and then just, you know, the kind of world that we're living in where just when you think the worst has happened, something else comes up and is like, gotcha, things could still get worse. And you're like, why? When will all this stop? So I just kept thinking in this book, it's got to happen. You know, of course, the great grandmother's going to die and ATN's going to get carted off and maybe the animals will die and maybe everyone's going to die. And in the end, it was so uplifting and it was so encouraging to know that things don't have to happen of great literary import, quote unquote, in order to make a good book and to be something worth reading. Right. True. True. Well, 
Um, yeah, the um, the baker Anais uh, is it was a wonder. You know, when the, this horse just puts her head in the baker's door, and she just says, "Oh." Two o'clock in the morning, and there's a horse. <laughs> there's a horse in my doorway. I should give it something to eat. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's just there's just something. So it it just makes you sort of giddy at a certain point. And that that she ends up with the with the guy who takes care of the park is is just perfect. Even that. Oh wait, that that reminds me. That was a funny, another little sly moment that. Uh, that Jane Smiley did. Where uh, I'll find it in just one second. Mary Pat, you you. Uh... Should I go while you're looking? Well, oh. I was. I, I've I've been reluctant to chime in um, until Kate just made her comment about. Um, oh, I, I'm I'm going to paraphrase, but nothing nothing grand needs to happen or, or of, of great literary import for it to be a good book, um, which I completely believe. Um, and I, I'm, I'm gonna rain on everybody's parade here. Um, and I don't, there must be something wrong with me because I, I, you know, by the time I got about three quarters of the way through the book, I could not wait for it to be over. And, and I will admit to a couple of times in that last quarter of the book with long descriptions going, okay, turn the page, turn the page, I got to get through this. Um, you know what? It was well written. And, you know, I'm not sad that I read it. It's the first Jane Smiley book I've ever read. Um, and actually, I mean, she writes beautifully and her descriptions of Paris and, um, I mean, makes me want to read more of her work, um, but it was you no, know, it was kind of, you know. And I, I actually, I finished it and I started the next, the Russian. See, this is saying something about me. Maybe James, like your mother said to you, why do you always? I, I started reading next month's book with all the Chekhov, and and I went, oh, I love this. So. Um, I just figured I'd 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 put that in there after after Kate's Kate's comment because I think it's you know no book is for everybody that's for sure and and I just think that this is and I wonder I, I mean I was going to ask this before although a couple of you have addressed it but I wonder if if the, this, the fact that this book came out. Uh, right at the end of this horrible year that we just all lived through. You know, I, I wonder if that gave it an extra you know, boost in people's minds because it was uh, an antidote, uh, maybe, and a kind of a book that, like it or not, uh, I mean, enjoy the book or not, the book is arguably about kindness and about the importance of kindness. Uh, and I think that that, um, I just keep thinking that it may have been overlooked had it not, had it come out two more, two years late, two years after this or three years before it. I just, it just seemed like it landed at the perfect moment for a lot of people to, to fall in love with it. Uh, and, you know, so I did find this while, while Mary Pat was trashing the book, I did find it. Um, Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Please don't trying. let that be my reputation now. <laughs> oh, Mary Pat. Oh, here she goes. All animals. <laughs> James? Yes. James, you took the words um, that the book was about kindness. You took the words right out of my mouth because that's, I thought the same thing. And I think I think it's easy to look at a book like this and think that it's simplistic when in fact it's not. I mean, this book took me back to childhood books that I read about talking animals, um, The Wind in the Willows, The Incredible Journey. I mean, books that had a different sort of tone than this, but um, it is about kindness. And um, 
you know, there's not enough written about kindness <laughs> these days. <laughs> you know, we're not living in an especially kind world. So I, I, I have to say, I, I'm not, I'm not a Jane Smiley fan. So I came to this book not, not quite prepared to like it, and I was just completely seduced by it, by the quality of the writing and the characterization. I mean, it, it really took me back to those talking animal childhood books, you know, which are based on fables back to La Fontaine. You know, I mean, there's a long history of this kind of story and, um, and the delight that those books bring. It, it really took me back to that, so. Yeah. If, yeah. It, since you mentioned um, children's books, the one that came to mind for me was Charlotte's Web. Oh, and yeah. And I think only yeah. because it's the, uh, Kurt is the, only the second rat I've ever liked <laughs> besides <laughs> Templeton in that movie, in that particular book. Yeah. But I wanted to uh, backtrack just a little bit, first of all, to uh, Kate's comments uh, about um, the, or no, it was Mary Pat when she trashed it. <laughs> it was about the uh, uh, book being a little light on plot. I mean, it just, it, it was a little slow going. And I think not every book has everything, but everybody has been saying the characters were beautifully drawn, animal and human. The, the setting was absolutely luscious, I think, you know, that whole Paris. Um, uh, writing, Jane Smiley, it's smart, it's funny, it's crisp. You know, that was all there. So the plot was just life unfolding and it doesn't drive page turning in the way that maybe every reader likes. So I would, I would just say that. But one thing more I wanted to add, and that was back a half an hour ago when someone said, I, I think people are moving around on the screen. I don't know who said it, but that the... Uh, horse walking around Paris, that that wasn't realistic. And that kind of bothered me too. I thought Paris is a big city. We have to suspend our belief, like Larry said. But I went on Google uh, Maps and I looked up Rue Marioni and then I did Street View. And on that street, there's one house that is completely covered in vines. You can hardly see the house and it's on the corner across from the park. And I'm not saying Jane Smiley used that house as a model, but when I saw it, I thought could happen, could totally happen. And I really enjoyed seeing that, that house and thinking this could, this could change. Oh, great. Okay. Not, not that Mary Pat needs anybody to defend her, but she is a huge animal lover, and she has a dog that is like her child. So <laughs> don't think ill of Mary Pat. Um, okay, I, so on I the can, lines, I need to kick that dog. Number. <laughs> <laughs> He's lying. <laughs> um, another book that came out that's kind of sim not similar at all in that it's about kindness is Anxious People by Frederick Bachman. So that's that's another one that. James would call a book like that a balm, and I'm the one that calls it like a brain sorbet, or had a yeah, a brain sorbet because it's something that you enjoy, but it's it's just a, a good story, well told, that that um, is uplifting. Okay, um, I have to go let my dog in. I'll be right back. One, yeah, uh, one thing about to piggyback on Allison, and then um, something to say, and Caitlin has something to say, but Allison. Um, you know, the book we're reading next month, the, the Saunders book, seven stories by the Russian masters. But, but the tone of that book, the tone of his criticism is so laden with kindness that it's, it's really quite extraordinary. Um, and, and, it's, and particularly for, I mean, just his journey in his life towards the state he's in now. <laughs> Is, is, is really quite remarkable because I always sort of thought, oh, this guy, you know, his early stories always fascinated me. But I think, oh, the last person I want to spend an evening talking with would be George Saunders. And now, you know, I wish that I, I knew him and we could, we could spend every Sunday together. I mean, he's just, there's just something about him that's the way he's grown into this feeling of the forgiveness and acceptance. And I mean, you can't read much of Chekhov without learning that you shouldn't judge people because everybody screws up all the time. 
but it's just really so that's that's a really wonderful thing um genevieve and caitlin who else but anyway talk genevieve speak um uh, okay thanks um mary your comment about charlotte's web i definitely had that feeling too in this book and i really thought raul was gonna bite it i didn't know about the old lady but i thought when Raul was having trouble flying and he was a little unsteady and he ran into Sid and they bonded, I thought, well, this is, this is, you know, he's on his way out. He's older. I was just wondering if anyone else had that thought. I, I was surprised nothing happened to him as far as the circle of life was concerned. No? No, no, one, thought, no one else thought that he was going to, yeah, I, I was worried about him. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I was thinking, um, someone said that the book was about kindness, and I think it's both about kindness and also about patience, and that's kind of, I liked the pacing of the book that the characters just existed, and it was about survival and just being, and what unfolded unfolded, um, because I think there's even a moment kind of in the climax of the book where a lot of the humans in the story, which could, you know, sway the outcome one way or another, have this thought of like, oh, the gendarme could check up on this house, but maybe tomorrow because all of this other stuff or Anais thought she was gonna follow Paras home and then she decided, well, maybe, you know, I have a lot to do. And so like, they just that laid back, giving each other time is part of what allowed the happy ending to occur and that those relationships to amicably develop. Nice. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, patience is, and again, to tie it to next month, I mean, those are, these are, those are all writers who are very patient writers, and, you know, and a lot of times very little happens in the stories. Yet all of life happens in the stories because that happens to us every day. Um, I also loved the fact, remember when, when she, when, when grandmama, great grandmama died, all the animals sensed something before they knew what had happened. And all the people who were connected to it also woke up with a sense of something, you know, something's bizarre here. And, the, and remember when Paris goes over to Frida and says, why are you barking? And Frida says, I don't know, but I haven't. Everybody needs to know this. Know what? I don't know. <laughs> I just know that something's happened and everybody needs to know about it. And, and, and it's just that sense that there's, you know, this web in the world that you're connected to. And sometimes we can feel it and sometimes we can't. And uh, we'd probably all be better off if we tried to pay a little more attention to it. Right. And, and uh, Sid knew about the network. Yeah. And he's the one that taught taught um, Raul, and that and that's when Raul had a little bit of um, you know realized maybe he wasn't quite as superior to everybody else as as he had thought. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, what happened to Nancy McDaniel? She disappeared. I can't see her. Is she there? No. The no. giant cat got her. Yeah, her giant cat got her. Wow. Um, any other uh, things that anybody wants to say? Okay. Hello. Oh, I can't. Hey, I'm sorry. The I couldn't say earlier because the cat. I couldn't move the cat. Speaking of kindness, I couldn't reach the keyboard and keep the cat. So, um, I thought that another interesting theme and something that we don't see a lot of is that sort of vulnerability, right? That that spoke to me. That willingness to take that risk. Like they were all taking these risks to go on these adventures or trying to fulfill themselves, whether that was her leaving her safe race track to go find who she was or Raul taking that last flight or, you know, being willing to be trapped in a house. Like all of these risks that they took to kind of fulfill themselves and that vulnerability, I thought was a nice theme too. That was it. No, that's great. And, 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 and remember, you know, Frida only finally comes in the house after Grandma Mouse died. She mm -hmm. comes and, and sits down next to Etienne and just crosses her 
and puts her head on his on his on his leg. Yeah, definitely. That was such a lovely scene with all of them with him after she had passed away. It was beautiful. Yeah. yeah I was rereading it this afternoon. It was just bawling. I thought, God, I don't remember being this moved by it before. <laughs> just, man, wait. Um, so I, I, let me just say this one of the little moments that she does so well. Uh, he's talking, now this is uh, the, oh, Pierre. Pierre's walking back to his shed, uh, and he's thinking. And, and but, but but there's this little moment that she does in this one sentence where she says, "He says when he was walking back to his shed at last, turning these thoughts over in his mind, he nearly bumped into that young woman, that not so young woman, who did the baking at the cafe." And so you just you. He just drops that little four-word phrase in there, and if you're paying attention, he's saying, "Oh, he's he's seeing her now as a possibility." Suddenly, he sort of he looked at her casually. She was too young for him. And now he's now he's saying, "Oh no, she's not so young." And I, and she just does that over and over in the book, and it, it's just so great. It's just so sweet writing because that's what we all do. Again, I mean, it just keeps coming back to the same thing everyone's talking about, how kind of it's the everydayness of life is, is in it. Um, the gendarme's breakfast, yes. Uh, and shoe selection. What? And his shoe selection process. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the drinking on the job. I yeah. thought only... I thought we only got to do that at bookstores. I didn't realize that French police got to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. One, one, uh, and then one last point I'd like to make. I realized as we were all talking that all of the animals in the book departed at at one point. Um, I mean, not not the horse because that was kind of the center of it. But Sid went away. Um, Raul took that last flight. Frida went off for a, for a couple of days. Um, well, the rats didn't, but um, but those three main character, those other three characters who were there at the beginning, all went off and then came back. And I thought that that really helped make the ending work because each of those animals had chosen then to come back together as a group. And so then when the moment came for Paris to say, okay, I have a plan, you know, they, they were as a group all ready to go and went. And then, you know, they, they, they formed the friendship and started out together, but they also had moments when they left and made the choice to come back to the group. Yeah, that's great. That's really, that's a smart. Paras also left when she almost got hit by the car. She decided not to cross the street. Yeah. One note on the, the guard uh, having a drinking problem. Uh, Jane uh, Smiley said she gave him that drinking problem because otherwise he probably would have pursued the horse and had to do something about it. So she said she wanted him to kind of be able to look away or be distracted with that. So that's why she gave them the drinks. Yeah. Huh. Um, okay. Anything else? Any final comments? Well, I just want to say to me, it seemed like everybody came back or, or found themselves. Like Paris, was, she was a racehorse and it didn't surprise me that she ended up back at the track because that was her true calling, so to speak. Um, that 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 was her nature to to run and be this um, be this racehorse, and and it seemed to me that others kind of found themselves, so to speak, at at the end. You know, their true animal nature or I don't I guess know how to really put that 
but that's what it seemed to me that they were all looking for, or maybe trying to figure out like who they really were, what was important to them, or I don't know, something like that yeah. in the end. I had a thought on her racing. What I love, the beautiful language, although I was a little bit in the camp of, it was a little slow going for me, the book, but, um, but I did love the description of Paris's running. Mm -hmm. So she wasn't running to beat somebody. She was running because she loved the feel of the run and because she was curious. And it reminded me of when one of my sons was running uh, cross country and he dropped off the team and they said, why are you doing this? He said, oh, I love to run. I don't want to have to beat anybody. There's no point. And so what the world she moved to with all these animals in her own little creation didn't have any of that competition beating anybody. It was all this kindness, like you guys are saying, and, and, and patience and being who you are. So even when she came back, I don't think she wanted to win things. I think she just loved the feel of the run and the description of her body running was very beautiful, I thought. Uh, great. Anything, Kate? Kate Montgomery, are you walking somewhere in in the world of Japan? Yeah, I'm. Uh, it's ten a.m. here, so I'm on the way to work. <laughs> Sorry, if that's, if that's distracting. Looks, looks like it's a nice day there. It's glad, I'm glad. That's good. It's beautiful. It's very, it's very nice. Okay. Um, James. Uh, I just want to say, I've tried communicating more with my cat and I'm getting nothing from her, but I've told her that she really should write a book so I could understand her the way I understood the animals in this book. But I have to, I know we're about over, but the previous president and his administration without getting into politics, the meanness the cruelness, when you were talking about the kindness, it reminded me a lot of people have enjoyed the TV show Shit's Creek because I think it's a similar people that didn't seem like very nice people, but over the course of the series, they become kinder and take care of each other just the way the animals and humans did in this book. So I think you're spot on that the timing of her writing this after we've gone through such a terrible four years and the violent insurrection, it's, this is so the opposite of all of that garbage. I think that's why it resonated with most of us. But Mary Pat, I was the only one who disliked monogamy, so you're fine. That's part of, part of well, literature. That's, it's gonna yeah, that's a, the appeal differently to everyone, that's usually. Huge. Yeah. I mean, I think it's great that people, and I'm glad you said it because that's, you know, it, it, it's especially when there's this many people who, you know, are, are liking it, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes a little unnerving to say, to say the opposite, but I think it's great, you know, and it, it is good. Um, remember when, uh, when Arms and the Man opened in George Bernard Shaw, came out on stage in great applause after the play opened and just as he was about to say something someone on the balcony went boo Shaw <laughs> looked up without missing a beat and said I quite agree with you young man but what are we two against so many <laughs> so you know it's just but it's but it's great I just I thought it was great that you said that because it's and it is, it's, but I thought, yeah, this, this, it is slow, but I thought the slowness worked for me in a really, in a, in a way that I, I just, I, I loved it. But slowness is a problem in many books, I agree. Um, anything else, Nancy Bainan? Um, Next month, George Sa Saunders, Swim in a Pond in the Rain, um, March 17th at 6 p.m., and we, we know this book isn't for everybody because it's 
it's very unique. It's it's like a uh, you're taking class with George, but it's so good. And he and I think James, you were about to say um, about George Saunders. It's it's that he does come from a position of kindness and just wanting people to enjoy reading, to be better readers, to just think about um, um, why the, the authors made these choices. And it's nothing, there's no, um, I'm the professor, you're the lowly student. It's just really kind of a one-on-one -on -one discussion. Um, and Caitlin uh, says that George is a Buddhist. So she thinks that's where his, he's a Buddhist. his whole demeanor comes from. Um, and you don't, you know, if you, you don't need to read all seven stories if you don't want to. I mean, but just, you know, try a couple and see if they speak to you because, and see, you know, but it's, I think he'll help you to see what makes these stories so important and so, you know, and so powerful, even though they're, most of them are quiet stories. Uh, and the story that he did the master class on uh, for booksellers, Gooseberries, has always been one of my favorite stories. And it's, yeah, I mean, it's so wonderful to hear him or watch him just kind of think about it and hear his thoughts and some of his students' thoughts about that uh, story that is only 12 pages long or 13 pages long. And uh, not much happens. Uh, and it's, it's really, it's, you know, he just teaches you to just keep sinking into things. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, well, all the years that I directed plays, and I'm, uh, fingers crossed, I'm still going to direct some, but I used to say to the, you know, to the actors that you, you know, it's not just the sort of the rhythm of the play that you're in, it's the kind of the, the river that's underneath the words. And then, the, and then even the rhythm, the, the river that's under that river is where you've got to find the, what, what's, what's supporting all of this energy. Uh, and, and I think that that's what good writing does. I mean, it just keeps, the layers just keep being exposed. And he's, he's really masterful at that. Um, so don't be daunted by it. I'm glad you brought that up, Nancy. I mean, because it, it, it's it's very very open and inviting uh, stuff. And and the seven stories are are just, uh, you know, if you haven't read some of them before, I you know you'll you'll just wow, this was, this was written in 1880, really, you know. So, um, okay. uh, the the nose is gonna is going to require you to uh, suspend all belief. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just fair warning. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you all. It's great to see you all. Thank and you. See you next month. Yeah, and thank you to everybody that joined us for the first time. Yeah, that was great. I'm having such a great group.